I'm Janice Allred. You're listening to Gospel Tangents. The best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. And first daily Mormon history podcast, I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to introduce Janice Allred. You know, 30 years ago, in September of 1993, six intellectuals were disciplined by the LDS Church. Five were excommunicated and one was disfellowshipped. So Janice Allred is the sister of uh, Margaret Toscano and brother and sister-in-law of Paul Toscano. Paul was one of those six and Margaret was excommunicated a short time later. Well, Janice is going to tell her story. She's kind of six and a half, seven, eight. Uh, uh, so anyway, we're going to learn more about Janice's journey as kind of a peripheral member of the September 6th. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have a legend. <laughs> Can you tell us who you are? And you actually have a famous sister and brother-in-law. I do. I'm Janice Allred. Uh, my famous sister is Margaret Toscano and her husband, Paul. <laughs> so they, Margaret and Paul are both two-time guests. This is your first time. It is, yes. Um, so it was good to see you at Sunstone a few weeks ago. Yes. Uh, um, I was able to wrestle you down, twist your arm really hard. <laughs> you were. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was interesting to me because they had a panel. Um, this is going to be aired in September. Right. D who... There was a scholar there, I'm trying to remember what her name was, and she had said it really should be adding you and Margaret September the September 8th and yes. so September 6th. Um, I wish I could remember her name as well, but um, I, I did not meet her, so I don't remember her name. <laughs> okay. But uh, I, I believe that she is writing a book or has written a book. Okay. which is coming out in September on the September 6th. Is that and, your signature? Yes. Yeah. And I guess the September 8th, I understand that I am in the book, but I was not interviewed. Oh, really? No. However, I have written extensively about my excommunication, and hopefully she did find that publication, which was, <laughs> which was from the Mormon Alliance, the case reports. That's right. Now, you you told me last year, it's taken me a whole year to get you on, that I should read that. And uh, so I did, and then it took me a whole year to get you back on. So, <laughs> Yes, I do remember meeting you a year ago, and I remember that was a very busy time for me, and so I'll, we didn't make the connection. Yeah. But I'm glad you, you were able to read my long account in the case reports. <laughs> yeah, it, it took a little bit. I think I had to find it on A books. It's one of those things it's, that's it's not It's hard on to find. Yeah. It's, it's very hard to find. It's out of print, and... I tried to find copies for my grandchildren, and it was very hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, September um, 2023 marks 30 years since That's right. 1993. And uh, so just as a quick refresher for those people who may not be familiar with the September 6th or the September 8th and how you tie into that, right. um, can you... Tell us who the September 6 are and just give us a brief thumbnail of, of their story and then we'll dive into your story. Ah, so September of 1993 was an interesting time for me. My family was actually in Mexico. My okay. husband is a professor at BYU and he was doing a sabbatical. Uh, my daughter had just gotten married in August of 1993. Oh, wow. We went to Mexico. I have nine children. Six of the nine went with us. My youngest was a year old. Mm -hmm. And so we went and we heard about what happened in September through a friend of mine who sent me the news articles. So these were all people I knew. It started with Lynn Whitesides, who was the president of the Mormon Women's Forum at the time. I was in the forum. She was a good friend. She was disfellowshipped. Then there was Levina Fielding Anderson, also a friend of mine, um, we were in the Mormon Alliance together. I think we were. I think we had started it. All the dates get confused, but Levina was excommunicated for a piece that she had done, published in Dialogue, that gave the history of the interactions. Be, let's put it this way: of the difficult interactions between the church authorities and the Mormon intellectual community. She was excommunicated for that. Uh, 
So that's Lynn Vina. Also Michael Quinn, a scholar. Um, I knew Michael um, not well, not as well as I knew Lynn and Levina. Then uh, Paul Toscano, my brother-in-law, whom I knew, of course, very well. Uh, see this, and then there was also Maxine Hanks, also a friend, and Avraham Gileadi, who I did not know personally, but I knew him as a, a scholar. Uh, his work was mostly on the Book of Isaiah. I later became acquainted with his wife, <laughs> so I know, you know, I have personal connections with. Did I give six? I think so. I think I did. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you got them in order. I, I don't think we've ever gotten them in order before. I That's don't know that awesome. I gave them in. I, maybe I got them in the right order. I don't know. <laughs> it was pure serendipity if I did. <laughs> so that was, of course, very troubling to me. At the same time, so this was 1993. In 1992, I had given a talk at a Sunstone Symposium mm -hmm. about God the Mother. And shortly after that, my stake president had called me in to discuss it. Now, do you want me to go into this as well? Um, sure. I do. Before you do, I do want to ask you, it does seem like Abraham Gileadi is kind of the odd duck yeah. out of the six. <laughs> That's true. Um, why, why is that? Why is he different than the others? Uh, I'll just give you my uh, own mm -hmm. understanding and interpretation. Others may differ. I think it's because Avraham was not part of the same Mormon intellectual community that the rest of them were. All of the rest of them were people who went to Sunstone and presented papers there. Avraham was different. He was a very popular speaker. He had a, lo a lot of people going to his lectures and followings, but he was not part of the Mormon intellectual community. Also, and here's maybe another important point, Avraham was never critical of the church institution or authorities, whereas I think most of the rest of the September 6th had in some way done something that questioned the authorities, something like that. Uh, Michael and his historical work had done things which were not pleasing to such authorities as Boyd Packer and Paul Toscano had been very uh, outspoken in his criticism of church authorities. Um, Lynn Whitesides and Maxine Hanks were both uh, feminists and did work in feminism, which was not regarded as following what the church wanted you to do. And Levina, of course, did her, her uh, history. It was a history. It, there was nothing in it except the history of the tensions between the church authorities and the Mormon intellectual community. So that's the difference that I perceive. And Avraham never wanted to associate himself with the other September 6th. He was always uh, distancing himself. He didn't give interviews, whereas I think all the rest of them did. Yeah. Could, I talked to Matt Bowman, and he hates talking about the liberal conservative divide. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to make Matt, when I say, Matt mad when I say this. That's okay. But uh, it does seem like Abraham was more of a conservative scholar yeah. and the rest of you were more liberal. Is yeah, that fair? Yeah, that's, that's fair. Okay. And so uh, so all six of those, let's, let's make sure we got them. Abraham, Lynn Whitesides, Paul Toscano, Michael Quinn. Um, Levina. Levina and, and Maxine, Maxine Hanks. Yeah. Um, so the six were excommunicated all in 1993. In one um, month, September, yeah. which is why they call it September 6th and why it seemed like a movement, like it seemed so important to people. Yeah. Because it happened so quickly. And I know it seems like it sh probably should have been the September 7 because Margaret was in some pretty hot water as well. Yes. But I think they were like, well, we went after Paul. We're not going to go after both of them. So they waited until 2000 to get her. That's very interesting. And, and Margaret talked about this a bit in her presentation at the uh, Sunstone Symposium session that we recently did. Yes, she had been uh, called in by her bishop and stake president both and commanded not to write or speak on certain topics, especially God the Mother and women in the, uh, in the priesthood. And um, yes, basically, both Margaret and Paul would tell you that this is what happened. Paul 
uh, got his red flag and waved it around and uh, got, got their attention. <laughs> got the bull to come after yes. him. Yes, and also Margaret was protected by two bishops who didn't. So um, again, this is a, a, a procedural thing. Right. Women are uh, tried in in ward, local ward courts, and men are if they have the priest are tried in the state state court. So uh, Margaret was protected by her bishops; they did not want to go after her, and it was uh, so. It took a while for the. Um, well, and even in the end, the bishop didn't go after no, her. It was no, he the didn't. stake, which was very unusual yeah. for a woman to go before the stake. Yes, it was very unusual, um, but that's what happened. Yeah. yeah. And so we have kind of skipped over you because were you in 1996? Am I remembering that right? 19. Well, uh, I had two courts. Oh. <laughs> the first one was in 1994. Okay. And the second one was in 1995. And the first one, I was, um, I always, I think I was put on formal probation with all of the same restrictions that would have been with disfellowship. And so you didn't get any blowback in '93 per se. No. Okay. No. Uh, but 1994 is only a year later. <laughs> you see, the, the, the wheels had already started with me in 1992. It was just delayed because of, of things that happened. So um, in 1992, I gave the speech at Sunstone uh, called Toward a Mormon Theology of God the Mother. Two months later, my stake president called me and my husband in for a talk. And he pointed out that this speech I had been given had been called to his attention. Now... So he wasn't just reading it? No. <laughs> <laughs> he would have never seen it. No one would have ever seen it. If, if It's um, a committee called the Strengthening Church Members Committee, which had been uh, discovered, outed by Eugene England, I think, a couple of years before. And basically, this committee was assigned to follow uh, certain people or to listen to all the talks at Sunstone and pick out the ones and flag ones that were that they deemed to be on forbidden subjects or too unorthodox, you know, dangerous. Heretical. Heretical, yes. And so that's how I got called to the attention of the authorities. And it was really interesting because my state president was, at this point, extremely apologetic. Oh, you know, I hope I'm not offending you by calling you in. But he did make one thing. He did say one thing, which I was willing to listen to, but not willing to, to make him a promise. He said, basically, you can never publish this speech. Just like Margaret. Yeah, you're, you're not allowed to publish this. And I said, well, here's the thing about publication. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's not like everything I've written or presented has been published. So I have no plans to publish it. I don't know that anyone would want to publish it, but I'll, I will say this. I, I will tell you if I plan to publish it. I did not say I will not publish it because, frankly, I would want to publish it. You know, as a writer, you do like to publish things. <laughs> So now this was your stake president? This program? was my stake president. So that's interesting that he jumped over the bishop. Oh, yeah. It came to the stake president and um, from the church, strengthening the church members committee. Uh -huh. So um, this was in, in um, August. It's before we went to Mexico. So it's in August of, of 1992. Two, okay. 1993. Oh. oh no. Wait a minute. No, this is 1992. We didn't go to to, uh, to we didn't go to Mexico until 1993. But this was it was right after, maybe it was in August. It was it was sometime. I gave the speech in '92. Sometime after that, the the uh, state president told me mm -hmm. I was not published it. Then comes you know my daughter's marriage. We go to Mexico. Before I left to Mexico. Was she getting married in the Mexico City Temple or something? No, no. My husband was doing sabbatical uh, in Mexico. She got married in, in um, the um, Manti Temple. Oh, okay. She wanted, to, she wanted to get married down there because it's a small temple. Anyway, mm -hmm. so we went down there. 
And I knew I mean, this was a time for me which was difficult because I knew that um, I could be in trouble <laughs> with the church. You knew that before giving the speech? Yeah. When I gave the speech, I knew that it was a subject which was um, not exactly forbidden territory, but it was it was an area where I knew that many women had been called in by bishops, had been disciplined in various ways, silenced in various ways. Uh, so Maxine Hanks had done her book called Women and a women in authority. Mm -hmm. I have a small piece in there, and Margaret has a piece in there. She just republished that, didn't she? It may have been republished. It, yeah, I think it's, it it's possible. in the last few years. You know, it, was, it was an excellent compilation, and there were many individual voices in there talking about, she had a whole section on women, the priest did, and God the mother, and women told about their experiences in being, in uh, uh, dealing with these topics and how church authorities had responded in many ways, negatively to to these things. So I knew that um, writing a speech about God the Mother could be a problem. Plus, the other thing. And you were still willing to do it. It was very important to me. Okay. Because you don't strike me as the rebellious. <laughs> I'm I'm not rebellious, as in I will just go out and rebel for rebellion's sake. <laughs> But if something is important to me, I'll stand my ground. Okay. And um, my work on God the Mother is somewhat different. Well, it's quite different than what many people have done because I take an approach. Um, I had been working on theological topics. This was 92 for 20 years, more than 20 years. Wow. And I had written a lot and studied a lot. And um, deep philosophical questions have been important to me my entire life. And so I got into theology through that, through that lens. That was, that was, uh, I started out by, by be, being very interested in the deep philosophical questions. And then because of my belief in God, it went that direction. Mm -hmm. So um, my study of the Book of Mormon, <clears throat> this was probably in the 70s when I came to the belief that um, Jesus Christ and God the Father are the same person, that there are not two persons. God this sounds like Paul Toscano. Yeah, it's very interesting because Paul Toscano believes the same thing. Yeah. Paul and I, and actually Margaret as well. Yeah, she, I know. She may not have... Uh, explain it to you. We all came to the same belief through our study of the Book of Mormon independently. Yeah. I'm just going to point out Paul has some very unusual beliefs. You need to check out that episode. It's pretty pretty interesting. Um, Paul, Paul's beliefs and mine are, are not exactly the same. And that's what Margaret said. There's a slight difference. There are but slight they're differences. They're very similar. They're very similar. But, but Paul and Margaret and I all start with the fundamental premise that God the Father and Jesus Christ are the same person. Mm -hmm. There are not two persons, you know, God the Father and Jesus. Jesus Christ is God the Father. And this is taught very clearly in the Book of Mormon. I won't go into it. I, this is not my purpose here today <laughs> to, <laughs> to convince anyone. We do anyone. do tangents. We may get into it. But yeah, anyway. but yeah, we can get into it later. But but that is the premise which, with which I begin my study of God the Mother. So I didn't have, you know, God the Father, one person each, God the Son, another person each, and then the Holy Spirit, another person each. I started out with be believing that the man we call Jesus Christ is also the Heavenly Father, the Father of our spirits, and mm -hmm. also the Spirit of Truth or the Holy Spirit. Though this was not as clear in my first um, essay, but uh, in that essay... I say there are two personages in the Godhead, God the Father and God the Mother. God the Father becomes our Savior, Jesus Christ. God the Mother becomes the Holy Spirit. That's what I taught in that one. My beliefs have, have I've been developing, this was in 1992, mm -hmm. and uh, that was quite a while ago. Eight plus 23, that's 31 years ago. <laughs> 
And um, I can I can tell you these dates because I remember which children were being born. So my son Joel was born in 1975. Okay. His name is jo- Yoel, which means Jehovah is God. Mm-hmm. I named him that because I had come to the belief that uh, Jehovah is God, is the Father. You sound like a Jehovah's Witness now. I do. <laughs> well, and actually, this is a Mormon belief. Uh, mm-hmm. Joseph Smith taught very clearly that uh, Jehovah is Jesus Christ. Uh, Mormons believe this. Mm-hmm. They just see, don't see Jehovah as the Creator God, the God of the old. You know, they see this other one. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so that's. Well, this I, already is going to get you in hot trouble. Oh yeah, I knew. I knew that when that and, and later this comes out with my bishop. He said, "You know, your greatest heresy is not what you say about God the Mother; it's what you say about Jesus Christ being the Father." <laughs> Which is interesting because it all goes back to the patriarchal thing. Mm-hmm. They don't care so much about what you say about God the Mother, but they care a lot about your view of. God the Father. So, because I've always been under the impression that it was more God the Mother that got you in trouble, but that's not really true. That's what called me to their attention. <laughs> but it was other things. That... So if you'd have just not said that, you'd have been okay? <laughs> no, I'd, who, who knows? I don't know. But, you know, when I came to the belief, to the understanding that, that my view of, of the Godhead is quite different than that which is taught by the church at this time, I knew that that could be a point of of, of trouble for me, mm-hmm. and the question was because this isn't even Trinitarian. No, this, it's not. This is no, it's very different. It's not Godhead. It's not God, Trinitarian. No, it's very it's different. Just the Toscano Allred <laughs> theology. Is that what we call it? I don't know what we call it. But <laughs> no, it's very different. It's not Trinitarian, and it's and and it's to my way of thinking, it is beautifully fundamentally outlined in the scriptures revealed uh, through Joseph Smith, uh, both the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, which accords, in my view, perfectly with the teachings about God in the uh, Old and New Testaments. And uh, it's I have devoted my life to understanding this. And the material that... Ha- is still available, the things that are still needed, that still need to be explained and thought through are profound. And so, no, it's it's a view that has been so fruitful for me and so important. So at that time, and again, you say I don't look like I'm rebellious, but I do stand up for what I believe. <laughs> and President Hinckley had just given his speech on the anti-praying to God the Mother speech. And that's when I said, "Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to um, write about God the Mother." And I knew that writing about God the Mother meant I needed to uh, present a uh, redefinition, a rethinking of the Godhead, which is what I did in my paper toward a Mormon theology of God the Mother. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Janice Allred, kind of an associate of the September Six. In our next conversation, I was surprised to learn that that she has been going to church for 30 years at the LDS Church. For us, the most important thing is our testimony of Christ. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, the church is important to me because I do believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet. And the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price, the revelations in those scriptures to me are so important in the theology that I have been working on. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, subscribe on either Patreon or at gospeltangents.com. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire audio uninterrupted. On our $10 tier, if you'd like to see the whole video, you can see that uh, either on youtube.com slash gospeltangents, or I've got a special Facebook group devoted for uh, full videos. So subscribe at gospeltangents.com and uh, sign up for just $10 a month. For $20 a month, if you'd like to get some bonus content, uh, maybe some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor, you can sign up for that. And then if you'd like to talk to me 
for a hundred dollars a month we'll, we'll do a monthly phone call on something like zoom and you can ask me anything you want so thanks again also don't forget about the merch mugs t-shirts um hats things like that i'm trying to get the ties up there hopefully i can get up up there and uh thanks again for watching gospel tangents and click here for some more videos